Bjorn Brems is a professor, uh, a professor of neurogenetics at the Institute of Zoology, University of Regensburg. And he got his PhD in the year 2000 uh, from the University of Würzburg. Um, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. And he is a first class advocate, thought leader, innovator, agitator for improving academic okay, publishing. We're done. Okay, we're done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm out. I would promise you wouldn't hear the word thought leader. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, yeah, that's fine, thanks. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to be here, obviously. Uh, I, I first have to say that uh, I also, like Mike, I, I'm, I'm not using textbooks in my teaching at all. Uh, the main point being rather that, that I don't have time to read books, I, I wish I, I would. And so I just try to find my materials wherever I can quickly get it, and that's rarely books, so that's, that's more the point of it. The reason I'm, I'm particularly excited to, uh, to speak here today is that um, in an email, so I don't know how public this is, uh, how open this is. In, in an email, I, I was notified that there were over 3,300 applicants to OpenCon, and there's only about 150 that uh, were uh, accepted, which means that OpenCon has a rejection rate of uh, over 95%, which, uh, according, to, uh, according to some uh, publishers, this means that you're the uh, world's best open that we have right here, and that, of course, makes me, <laughs> that of course makes me, very, makes me very nervous. Um, and, and so another, another aspect that makes me nervous is that uh, in the last, so I, I haven't been around as long as Mike has, um, only for about, for about 10 years in that, uh, in that respect, in, in, in the open respect. And uh, what I've noticed in the last couple of years, and particularly in, in this year, is that these, these meetings sort of um, all seem to become more and more alike in that uh, on the one hand, which is very understandable, well, in both, both, both uh, sides are very understandable. They, they've become very self-congratulatory now that a lot of things are starting to move and things are working and then we find the, you know, the epic wins and, and we're all thinking we're doing all that well. And on the other hand, we're still discussing essentially the same sort of issues over and over again. And I feel more and more that I, uh, and, and more and more of these meetings, I feel like I sound like a broken record. Like I'm repeating the things that I've written, I'm repeating the things that I've said before. So I've sort of tried to be a little bit contrarian today and it, it, uh, listening to you guys uh, for, for this day, it seems like I, I pretty much failed. It's like, it's gonna be very hard to provide a sort of a contrarian aspect. Uh, so for instance, the main point I'm going to try to make today has already been touched upon. So essentially, I could probably go through my slides here and be done in about 20 minutes because essentially all the points that I'm trying to make have probably been touched upon already. So I'll try not to do that. But um, one of the main points I'm going to try to do to, to make today is that uh, we need to make being open as easy as possible and not to make people go, try to convince people to go the extra mile to be open. So the point I'm going to make is that we have to make open the default that people have to go the extra mile to not be open, because there are all legitimate reasons in, in many areas to not be open. And so, but that should be, the, that should take extra effort. And so we need an infrastructure. We do have an infrastructure, but what we need is an infrastructure that um, is worth that name. And what would be that infrastructure? Um, I will try to, try to present that in roughly the following way. I'm first gonna present you my perspective on where I see the major issues are. I try to do that fairly quickly because I think we agree on most of those. Then I'll present three small sections. First on what we are trying to do in our lab to walk, walk the talk. Then what I think what you as early career researchers could do. And then what I think we as a community should be doing. And then uh, you, we can maybe later tonight over beers discuss of how ridiculous that is. Um, so scholarship, right? We need infrastructure for scholarship. And scholarship contains either one or two or all three of those components. It's either some narrative that we publish in one way or another, some data in the experimental sciences. We have some data. We also generate data in non-experimental sciences. Um, but the experimental sciences are those that who, hands up, who's, who's doing experiments? Who's, who are experimental scientists in here? So that's a roughly about a third, I would say. Um, so uh, that's the kind of data that me as an experimental scientist, I'm, I'm mostly familiar with. But of course, paleontologists, for instance, they also generate data, but they don't do experiments. Um, and then code, right? And 
there are plenty of areas left in science and humanities where you don't have to write code, but those are getting fewer and fewer, and those where you have to write code are getting uh, more and more common and get, get getting more and more numerous. So those are the three things, either one or two or three of which uh, we're producing. Now let's have a look at what our institutions are doing to take care of our output. Right? That's the main thing that our brains generate, is those three things. So let's have a look at the literature. This is pretty fast. This is probably why most of you are here, because you're familiar with these sorts of things that our literature is quite dysfunctional. I'm not going to go through all that list, just a few things. Well, most of you are probably aware now that uh, limited access is one issue of functionalities that we would be likely to get rid of, we would like to get rid of in our literature. Uh, well, we've also talked a little bit about impact analysis, that this is not really scientific at the moment. Uh, we know all that. Peer review has also been mentioned. Um, there's no global search, really. Google Scholar does a fairly good job, but still, you know, uh, with its, its own issues. Functional hyperlinks are something that we can discuss endlessly that they don't really work in the way. Uh, so anybody who's ever clicked in a method section on um, these uh, experiments were done as previously performed and has watched what happens, know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about functional hyperlinks. Data visualization, I'm going to talk about that later a little bit. Submission standards, statistics. Uh, we know that, right, publishers prevent content mining, so that's something we'd really like to do. There's no effective way to sort, filter, and discover, no networking feature, and so on. So essentially, if we took, if we carved uh, our papers, our literature in stone, took our cell phones, took pictures of it. We'll lose some functionality, but not a whole lot if we put then those pictures, if we put them online, right? Um, if you think this is bad, then data is even worse. So if you look at uh, an, a recent estimate of how much of the data that we generate is actually uh, accessible, it's about 25%. Some of that uh, some of those 25% those are in structured databases, some of those are in supplements, some of those are uh, uh, in, in their own, uh, like on websites and, uh, and other uh, less structured databases. And if you only look, and on the rest is like in, in, in disks and in drawers. So if you look at those, even if you look at those 25% of data that are actually available, and then you look at those that are considered the most stable and among the most uh, reliable and important ones is, for instance, is PubMed. And so even PubMed being run by the US government, even PubMed was, uh, you know, a few months ago, um, on the verge of collapsing due to, la due to issues with political issues about government funding. So this message here about PubMed has been designated to be maintained with minimal staff during the lapse in government funding, it's easy to see that if that would have gone on for another couple of days or weeks, that essentially most of the biomedical research uh, in the world would have come to a grinding halt. So this is, and this is what accounts for one of the most stable places to put your data, right? Your sequence data, this is essentially what I'm talking about in this, this aspect, right? And even that can be gone and, you know, it, with some bad luck, irrevocably so, uh, within a couple of days. So if you thought data and literature was pretty bad, it's even worse for code. For code, there essentially doesn't really exist anything that's even in, in, in some conceivable way sustainable in any me, even medium term. There's things like SourceForge and GitHub, but you don't even know if those are going to be around 12 months from now. Uh, and so people have been starting to realize this. Uh, there's a, a publication that says that papers in this journal should make computer code accessible where possible. Well, it's very nice that people are starting, get, starting to get the idea that sharing code uh, is, a, is something that uh, we should be doing when the first time I found a trace of people, of scientists sharing code was actually uh, people who programmed this monster in 1953 because they were sharing the code quite openly amongst each other. So it's been a quite a couple of years since then. And this is still not standard practice. So we're faced with a dystopia at our institutions right now uh, where we can, get, we can e get email as if we wouldn't have one already. Uh, we can get web space. We can get a blog, a library access card. We can, of course, get green open access repositories. But what we don't get, what we don't get in a standard form of way which is about as standard and unobtrusive as email is we don't get a place where we can archive and share our publications. We don't get a place where we easily and conveniently can archive and share our code in a sustainable way, where we can archive and share our data. That just apparently the three things that we produce are the things that our institutions care the least about because they don't really do anything in that respect. So how bad is that? 
Well, it's, it, at least it's bad enough that people all over the place who have some coding experience, they sit down and they write their own solutions. Some of those have been presented here today in the previous sessions. Uh, and there are a total, there's a, a person in the Netherlands, Jeroen Bosman, he's keeping track of all those developments. And uh, he tells me that there's now about 575 and counting uh, different solutions. And you'll recognize if you look at the, uh, if you look at the uh, logos here, you'll find that for the different sections of scholarship, there's different solutions. Uh, some of them are very well known, some of them are, are less well known. So that's one of the consequences of that is that, well, people do it for themselves. Scientists are resourceful and they create their own solutions for things that actually should be taken care of by their institutions. Now you might say that, well, this is a really a minor issue. This essentially means that all the problems that this Brems guy here in front is talking about are actually solved. You just have to find one of those 555 ones that's do, that, that is really doing what you want it to do. But clearly, um, the issues with fragmentation uh, are, of course, more than just a nuisance. Um, but so how bad, how bad is it really, right? Besides fragmentation that we're already used to with 30,000 different journals, how bad is it really? What, what consequences are we facing of having a fragmented and dysfunctional infrastructure? One of the things that I'm trying to pick out, which is because they're so prominent and they've been raised many times before, is journal rank, right? So uh, it's only the world's best scientists, right, that publish in the high-ranking journals, right? That's the, that's the idea that, has been, that Mike has been talking about. And so that's also one, uh, one aspect where I may be a little bit contrarian, even though I'm probably not going to be very successful at it. Um, I'm not going to, what I'm not going to go into with regards to journal rank is the impact factor, because uh, that's plain, uh, it's, it's easy. Th this information that I'm going to present here on this one slide, that, it, that the impact factor is negotiable, irreproducible, and mathematically unsound, is uh, accessible. It's, everybody can find that. And it, the only point I'm trying to make with this slide is that uh, the impact factor is not really a calculated number. It's a made up number. And my suspicion is the reason why it's made up, why the, you can't really calculate it, is that you sell more of impact factor accesses, if you're Thomson Reuters, if they conform to the preconceived notions of journal rank. Like if you had a rank where nature and science don't come up on top, it's pretty hard to sell. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about now for the next couple of slides is journal rank. It is counted as impact factor, but essentially what the impact factor does, it correlates very highly with your subjective impression of what is a good journal and what is a less good journal. That's why I'm using impact factor here, even though it's a made up number. And in this case, because of its correlation with our subjective impression, it's actually a quite useful way um, when I want to compare uh, different venues. So, the question that you can ask then, well, if we all have this, or at least most of us have this subjective notion that all the good stuff is published in certain places and all the horrible stuff is published in other places, um, is that actually the case? Or is it more like the horoscope, like when you open up the newspaper in the morning and you read that you're going to meet the love of your life today and that you're the smartest person on the planet and that uh, uh, you're going to do really well and you're going to win the lottery, then of course everybody thinks, yeah, this is really me. This is accurately describing me, so there's got to be something to the horoscope. And then if you lose the scientific method, then what you find is that actually it's uh, probably not as accurate as you thought. And so let's use the scientific method to look at, uh, to look at journal prestige, if there's any data that we can use to back journal prestige up other than a made up number. One of the things you can look at is this idea that, well, it's based on citations. Right? The impact factor is somehow based on citations, so that would mean, uh, so the citations that a journal gets leads to the impact factor that the journal then receives. Does that also hold in the other way around? So does an article that's published in a high impact factor journal also, le read, also receive a lot of citations? And that uh, is very uh, disputable. It does so to some extent, and statistically significant because the numbers are very high, but the in practical means this is a fairly uh, low, a fairly small effect. So what's plotted here on the uh, y-axis is the annual coefficient of determination. That's essentially how well, if I make a correlation between journal rank and citations, how well does that, do these numbers fit on a straight line? And so the lower this value is, the worse the correlation. And what you find is if you back calculate from the invention of the, of, uh, the impact factor around the 1960s, if you back calculate it, what you find is something between 0.1 and 0.15, which is a very, very low, very, very low correlation. 
and uh, no coefficient of determination. And then once it was uh, invented, essentially to tell libraries which journals to subscribe to, and of course then at that time, um, before the internet, you could only cite what you could read, and you could only read what your uh, library subscribed to, then the correlation went up, but not even then, you know, at the most, to a level of 0.25 to 0.3, which is, again, as I said, statistically significant, but practi practically negligible. It essentially boils down to something like, you know, a cit citation or two, three per year uh, for a higher rank journal as opposed to a lower rank journal. So that, on the grand scheme of things, that really doesn't make a whole lot of difference on your citations. And as soon as people could at least read titles and abstracts, so they knew if someone had done something related, they could cite it even though they didn't really know maybe for all kinds of reasons uh, what was in the paper. But title and abstract enables people to cite whatever is relevant, no matter where it's published. And of course, this correlation then goes back down to where it was before to almost nothing. So it doesn't mean if you publish in a high ranking journal, it doesn't automatically entail that you're going to get a lot more citations than if you publish it anywhere else. Now let's look at methodology, right? So citations is always thought that, well, a lot of citations mean that it's a really good study, right? Whereas one would probably more find that it's a very, uh, that, that it's more utility that you can count with citations. But uh, here's a very recent uh, paper that looked at how the papers were actually done. Now, this is tricky to do. Um, and this paper takes a shortcut by evaluating the method section and by looking at uh, what was the, or how was the experiment described as being done, right? So that's what we're, what we're seeing. What we're going to see here now for the next three slides, I think, is some measure of the journal impact factor. And what we're seeing in this slide on the y-axis is the prevalence of reporting. So how, what's the fraction of articles in, you know, these sections of uh, the impact factor uh, scale that have randomized their experiments? And what's the fraction of articles that have blinded the assessment of outcome. And those are animal in vivo experiments. And so you could say, and what you find, what you find is that there's a negative correlation, a significant negative correlation, such that the highest ranking journals have the lowest uh, amount of randomization in their, uh, in their articles. And there's no correlation whatsoever uh, here between a blinded assessment of outcome. So there's no evidence that in terms of randomization, or in, in terms of proper methodology when evaluating the outcome, that the journals, the high-ranking journals publish anything that's better in, than publish anywhere else. If anything, there's evidence that it's worse what they're doing. Now, you could say that, well, that it's worth the, the studies they publish are worse. Now, you could say that, well, of course, in the top journals, everybody knows it's randomized, so you don't have to put it in the methods. Right? You can always say that. So let's have a look at some other, uh, some other quantifiable statistics, uh, statistic on uh, methodological quality where we can actually do, test what the uh, authors have done. One of those things is statistical power. And statistical power essentially tells you how well was the experiment designed with regard to effect sizes, sample sizes, and variation uh, in your samples. And the uh, convention is that in order to have a reliable experimental design, you have to, be, you have to reach 80% statistical power or more. Now, if we look at the, you know, the four high-impact uh, papers uh, in this study, and this is a neuroscience study, so it's a different set, a different field again than the one before. It's neuroscience studies. You find that three quarters of those studies do not reach the 80% criterion, which is approximately the same amount as uh, everywhere else. So. Also, in this case, if you can actually look at experimental design and don't have to rely on the statements of the authors, you also don't find any evidence that there's anything methodologically superior in these journals. Now, you could say that, well, you know, that's these uh, stupid neuroscientists. They don't know how to design a study. Let's look at people who do gene association studies between single genes and a certain phenotype. And then again, we, on the x-axis, we have the impact factor. And on the y-axis, we plot uh, each individual study, so each circle is a study, uh, and we plot if that has uh, overestimated the actual, and then you do that with a meta-analysis, the, um, uh, the actual effect size between this one gene, uh, or polymorphism, and, um, and the phenotype, and wh or whether it hit the actual effect size or whether it's underestimated the actual effect size. And what you find there is two significant correlations. One of them is that the higher up you go, the impact factor ladder, the journal rank ladder, 
the more you overestimate the effect size and the smaller is the sample size that you're using to do that, which statistically speaking is quite obvious because with small sample sizes, the only thing you can get significant are huge effects. Now you could say that, well, you know, this is all, you know, those, uh, this is field specific. Look in any other field and you won't find that. And this is just, you know, this particular study. So we'll have another one. Let's have another look. This is uh, crystallography. And so you shoot x-rays at molecules, uh, at crystallized molecules, and you derive a computer model from the diffraction that you measure uh, once the x-rays went through uh, those molecules. And what these uh, crystallographers can do is they can compare the bond distances, so between, let's see, between a carbon and a hydrogen atom, and they compare those in the computer model to those that are published the way they actually have to be, right? So that we know what these bond sizes need to be, what these bond distances, and then you can derive a quality metric that's independent of the complexity, don't ask me how they do that, uh, that is independent of the complexity of the molecule. So you get something that gives you, and this is what they plot here on the y-axis, the authors plot here on the y-axis, in case you can't read it, the quality measure, and where lower is better, and then they order so each tiny little dot here is one of those computer models for one of those molecules. And they plot here, uh, so now this is not journal rank, but it turns out to be almost journal rank because they just plot it according to their average quality of, their, um, uh, of those models. So those are the best models in this journal. That's the European Journal of Biochemistry. And here are the worst ones. Right? And the worst ones here are cell, science, nature, embo, nucleic acids research, and these sorts of things. So, no matter where you look, those are, this is a quite broad overview over the kind of studies that, that we looked at, and uh, those are the other ones that I know. Clearly, you can always say that, well, you know, tomorrow is going to come out a study that shows the opposite, but all the studies we looked at either showed no relationship whatsoever with any kind of methodological metric that you can think that, that people have studied, and if there has been some uh, statistically significant correlation, it's always been negative, not a single one has been positive. So there's no evidence that uh, these top journals publish methodologically more reliable or more sound research than any other journal. On the contrary, you could actually all even say, and I think the uh, data I just showed back that up, that it's the most unreliable research that is being attracted by these journals because, wow, I've done three of my 10 intended samples, I have this huge fantastic effect. Nobody would have thought that I'm going to send it to nature and they're going to say, wow, this is a huge effect. Who would have thought that? And they're going to publish it. So things, especially in experimental sciences, right? The more unlikely something is, the more likely it is to be interesting to these sorts of journals. Now, that being said, um, one can, so already, if you just look at the published, if you just look at the published literature, you can already make that statement. Now what you can also do is you can look at the retracted literature that's not published anymore officially. You can look at the retracted literature and see, well, does that hold up? Now, important here is that if you look at retractions, you always get, also get confounding factors into it like uh, error detection, right? You could always say that if there's more retractions in those journals, it's because to, due, due to more visibility in these journals and, and the higher error detection rate. But you could also get the opposite. You could, you could find that, well, you know, all your studies that you just showed, those four or five, they don't capture the entire, all those fields, they're just particular to those fields. And in, in effect, the studies in these journals are actually much better. So even if they have a higher error detection rate, you wouldn't see that because there's, not, no, there's less errors to detect. So there is a possibility that if you look at retractions, you might actually find the opposite. It's only that if you find something that you already know from the published literature, it doesn't tell you a whole lot more. But what you do find is then, uh, which doesn't tell you a whole lot more, but it corroborates the suspicion that you already have when you just look at the published papers, is that if you look at the retracted papers, you find that there's a much larger fraction of journals with a high retraction rate for errors, in this case, or honest errors, not fraud, um, compared to the many, many, many retractions that you have in this low range. So you also get journals in this low, lower range that have a pretty high retraction due to error, but they're just not that common. What this also tells you is that if you look at all of the retractions on an absolute scale, not on a relative scale, is that the motivation to retract articles in this lower case is not zero. So 
what I read from this is that there's a pretty high motivation to retract articles no matter where they're published, in the higher or in the low ranking journals. But I don't have any evidence for that. And if you look at fraud or suspected fraud, you find an even stronger tendency, which is probably not all too surprising either, because why would you try to submit your fraudulent data into a journal that doesn't guarantee you a job anyway? So with that being said, the, you know, the strongest correlation that you can find with impact factor, among the strongest correlations that you can find with impact factor is retraction rate. So the higher the impact factor, the higher the retraction. So this is what this graph shows. And of course, there you have several factors that go into it. Visibility is definitely a factor, but clearly also the lower levels or lower standards of methodological quality are also a factor that influence into this compound result that we see here. So essentially what we're doing when we're selecting for people who publish here, we're selecting for people who publish unreliable science, and that's what we've been, done, we've been doing for the last 20 years. Right? For the last 10 or 20 years, what we've been doing is we've been promoting and hiring people who tendentially, it's all a statistical effect, obviously, right? it's not an all or none thing, it's a statistical effect. We've been hiring people who have a tendency to publish unreliable research. So and what consequence could that possibly have to hire people who, uh, preferentially hire people who have a tendency of publishing more unreliable research? And again, this is a graph that has multiple factors in it, but uh, it is probably uh, not far-fetched to conclude that if you hire people who publish, tendentially, who publish uh, unreliable research, that in general, your research becomes more unreliable. Right? That's the whole idea. That's how evolution works. And this is what we find. If you look at the numbers of retractions in PubMed per 10K publications, it's been increasing exponentially um, ever since the 19, I don't know, 90s or something like that. And uh, the interesting thing is something you should never do, and everybody does anyway, me including, is you should never extrapolate exponentials. And this is an exponential curve. Uh, so we all know this is not going to go on like this forever. But if it were, then, you know, sort of like uh, the growth curve of humanity. If it were going on for like forever, we'll hit 100% retractions in 2046. <laughs> Which means that if the younger ones in this audience, if they get a job, they'll still be employed at that time. And just like with growth rate in humans, uh, it's not going to get to 100% before it gets really ugly. The question is, what's going to happen when it turns ugly, are we going to be in control or is some, something external going to, to be in control and make sure that this curve does not go, uh, not, does not continue the way it is continuing now? So what we've come to see in the public and in the general media, such as Jan-Hendrik Schön, Wusak Wang, Dietrich Stapel, Horuma Oruko Obuskata, Mark Lacour, Mike Lacour, uh, is really, if you look at it in the grand scheme of things, is really the tip of the iceberg. It's not a few black sheep, it's the tip of the iceberg. And uh, whether or not, and for the reliability of a scientific finding, it's actually quite irrelevant if, the, if it comes about due to intention or due to unintentional error. The unreliability is there nonetheless. And that was already the case, and the reason I'm, I'll get to it in a second, I'll get to the reason why I show all these uh, general newspaper reports. They're already in 2005, the New York Times posted an article about a global trend with more science and more fraud. In 2013, The Economist wrote How Science Goes Wrong on a title. In Germany, a whole a TV segment of a very popular science show, of the most popular science show in German public TV, uh, it started, it was, the whole segment was all about, uh, or the whole episode actually, was all about scientific misconduct and the reasons for them. And it started out with a question of whether you trust scientists or not. In 2015, the New York Times again, writing about scientists who cheat, it has gotten worse 10 years later after they already said it's gotten worse. Um, in, at, a recent, at, a recent in, um, at a recent meeting in Great Britain on the causes for unreliability, the technical causes underlying you know, outside of outside outright fraud, this sort of the six, they, they isolated six issues in terms of methodological error. Uh, one of them is data dredging. The other one is omitting null results, uh, underpowered studies, weak experimental designs, underspecified methods, and errors. And if uh, I've been clear in the data that I've shown just a couple of slides earlier, then you might have noticed that four 
out of those six points that have been uh, identified here are especially prevalent at high impact journals. So in that respect, it's quite uh, interesting and uh, sort of reminds me of the fox in the hen, ho in hen house that one of those high impact journals has an actual special issue, special supplemental archive on challenges in irrepro irreproducible research, never ever mentioning um, one of the main factors driving that irreproducibility. And so the reason that everybody is talking about this is, uh, I, I hope, are quite clear now and why we are, should be worried about this is that because most of uh, our research is publicly funded and the public is getting the message, fraud is getting worse, science is getting less reliable, which essentially means that everybody's livelihoods and experiments are at stake if we don't fix that sort of reputation issue that we have. So that's what I think, uh, how bad it is. I think it's quite an, a, a disaster. Um, and you may have noticed that the word access really hasn't cropped up all that often. So I personally think that, at least from a researcher perspective, and clearly other people have other perspectives, but access has never, um, uh, has never the, the, the issue of, of getting access to the literature has never shrunk. So it's been a big issue for the almost 20 years that Mike's been involved in it. It may have gotten marginally better around the ends, but it's still a major issue. That's why essentially most of us are here. But on the grand scheme of things, on the entire functionality issue and on the in entire uh, uh, reliability issue, especially, of course, then in the experimental sciences, it's really a drop in the bucket because all the other things have grown so much worse. It's not that all of a sudden access is not an issue anymore. It's just that it's been overtaken by all those other issues that I've been talking about now for the last, for the last uh, half hour and a little bit more. So what do we do about that? Um, one of the things is that um, it's, uh, if you focus on just access to the literature, you're probably not going to automatically solve all the other issues. And if we now generate meetings and task force for all the other issues, that's going to be a fragmentation of the advocacy groups. And if you focus just on access, these sorts of things are bound to happen. I don't know if you noticed that a couple of weeks ago, Emerald Publishing increased their APCs, their author processing charges, by 70%. And that's not because their costs gone up. That's simply because they've realized, hey, there's a lot more for us in this big $10 billion bucket than just the measly couple of bucks that we're actually making. So what determines how much we're going to pay for an open access article, as long as we have for-profit publishers in there, is not going to be what their costs are. It's going to be how much can they charge for it and still survive and actually make a profit that's better than their competitors. So, oh, that's where my font went. This is actually a different font usually. All right, anyway. So how do we solve that? If you're not, you know, if just solving access doesn't solve the rest of it automatically, how do we solve that? And I think what we need to do is we need to do the same sort of thing um, that we have done in, in many countries all over the world with recycling. So the situation we're in right now is pretty similar. Like we're pleading, like Dora is pleading, oh, please don't use the imp impact factor. And then we're pleading, we're advocating, right? It's an advocacy group. We're advocating, oh, please publish open access. It may hurt your career. It may be more work. Please publish open access. Please make your data accessible. And everybody says, oh, yeah, that would be so cool. We should really do that. And you're a representative, right? You're a representative of the people, of the idealists that actually they go the extra mile. For everybody else, it's like this. Yes, I think we really should be, we should be recycling, but I have this dumpster in front of my, you know, on the other side of the street or behind my house. I just drop it off there and I'm done with it. It's very hard to convince people to do what you're all doing. You're, all, you're these people. You take your car with your recyclables, you drive to the nearest recycling station, and you make sure that the brown glass goes into the brown bucket and the white glass goes into the white bucket. That's the equivalent. I find it um, idealistic to assume that we can get everybody to behave that way by not, and not changing the underlying infrastructure. I find it a lot more promising to assume that people are like most people, that they will use the dumpster behind the house much more readily than drive their car 10 miles to get rid of their recyclables. So that's what we should do. We should get people the equivalent of the different recycling bins in front of their house that get picked up such to make it easy 
for everyone to be open, to make it easy for everyone to share, and to make it difficult to do the opposite. How can we do that? Right? So the idea is to make it effortless, low risk, and make open science the default, and everything else difficult. Three ways, and I have to speed up a little bit. This is, those are three pictures of uh, three different experiments in our lab, behavioral experiments in the fruit fly. Um, and what you can see is that it's a lot of electronics, and they run these experiments. So we need software to control the experiments and to save the data, and we need software to analyze the data. And so, as has been mentioned before, we use GitHub, where we put, uh, where we put the software so people can download it, people can check it, and if we move labs, we have all the stuff with us right away. So we use that. We also work with uh, SciForge, which is a, uh, a DFG, that's the main funder in Germany, a DFG-funded program to make sure that we have all the right prerequisites and technology to provide our code with persistent identifiers such as DOIs. This is very similar to something that Zenodo already does in a collaboration here with GitHub. In integrating GitHub into Zenodo makes sure that your GitHub code gets a DOI if you combine it with the Zenodo repository. Another thing that we're doing is we're trying to make sure that it's not extra work to be open. So the usual way in which our experiments are, uh, uh, are published is that you design the experiment, then the experiment is automated, so the metadata are produced automatically, the data are produced more or less automatically, and then all of that gets into um, uh, a graph with statistics that we generate, we use R to do, we, with R we plot the data and we make the statistics, and then we send the journal not the data and not the code, but we send them actually a figure, like a, a, a Photoshop, a TIFF, or Illustrator, or something, figure. And then the journal may ask us, okay, but put your data in this database. And then you have to do extra work to do, you know, collect your data and make sure that it's all in an intelligible way, and then you uh, do extra work to publish it. Now, what we're doing is, we, since we have R already, we can use R OpenSci and R FigShare at the moment, uh, we just take all of this, and whenever we're generating one of those figures on our screen. We want to see, okay, I've done my experiments for today. I'm going to head home for my family. What, uh, what is the experiment looking like? How, what were the results for today? Whenever we do that, the data are automatically uh, published with Figshare, assigned a DOI, and citable. We don't even have to do anything about it other than uh, f putting the effort in to write that uh, Figshare code, but, uh, that, that uh, R code. But once the R code is done, every single time you do it, you upload the data automatically. You don't have any, any, any additional work with it. So we do that with R, and then what we can do in principle, our code is there, our data is accessible, and then in principle what we can do is we don't have to send the uh, journals a, a, a Photoshop reduced figure, right? It's completely useless if you want to machine read it, for instance, or if you want to check if we selected the right part of the experiment for display, which we shouldn't have checked, not the training, uh, and not the test phase, but the training phase of the experiment. This, these, these Photoshop figures are completely useless. But what we could do is we could just tell the publisher, here's the data, here's the code, uh, and here's the figure legend. This is what you should do at this point where usually the figure is. And this is what we've done with F1000 Research. Uh, this is the article. It's actually a, a very uh, uh, article that's essentially only important for the Josophila people um, and for nobody else, really. But what we've done here is that if you go to figure three, and you, you, you want to look at figure three, what you find is it says loading, please wait, because that's when they load the data and the code to visualize the data. And then you get the usual bar graphs, you have these you know, five different groups with two measures in each group, and then as a proof of concept that this is actually dynamic and that you can have a look at different aspects of the data, you can also just use a different way of, re of plotting the figure like that. Now this is very trivial, but of course it's easy to understand how you can just expose the variables that you're interested in, and then the reader can just pick the variable that they actually want to see, not the, in this case, the, this one variable, but some other variable that we're not even showing and they can test the data. And that comes at, no, if, if this is an infrastructure that's supporting this sort of stuff, that comes, we save a lot of work by doing this, and enable a lot of functionalities and a lot of things that usually take a lot of work. And this is how everything should be. It should be easy to do these sorts of things, easier than doing it the old-fashioned way. Another thing that we did, and I won't, go into, I won't have time to go into this, another thing that we did is uh, have other uh, 
what this allows are the green ones are our data and then three other labs have contributed their fly tests just because they wanted to see how does their fly stocks look like compared to ours. So these sorts of things you can do there as well. But now enough of what um, we are doing. Now what could you do? What, can do? what can the early career researcher do? And I'm afraid there's not really a whole lot. The system's been rigged by the old farts like me, right? So we're the ones that are actually have the most access to the longest levers. And there's a very small levers that you can do, but there's a little, a little things that you can do. One of the things that are important is uh, that I would never ask, some, other, some people have made that decision themselves and I really respect that. I was never bold enough to do that. I've never risked my career for these sorts of things. The kind of stuff that can happen to you if, if you don't publish in high-ranking journals is uh, what happened to my Argentinian postdoc not too long ago who applied to the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for a scholarship. And when they rejected his uh, scholarship application, one of the things that they wrote is that his competitors had more cutting-edge publications in internationally highly recognized top journals. So this is what happens to you if you don't do it. What's, what can happen to you if you don't do it, if you don't come from Berkeley or Stanford, then uh, this might happen to you if you come from Argentina. Um, or if you try to apply for a professorship at a very well-known, uh, probably the most prestigious uh, university hospital in Germany, is then if you go, if you look at the, uh, what they say, this is in German, so I'll translate it in a second. This is essentially the instructions of what you should provide when you're applying at this university uh, hospital. And what they say is a complete list of publications, blah, 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 and impact points and all those things. So essentially, if you don't provide your impact points so they can count it and tabulate it, um, you're out of the race, essentially. So these sorts of things happen. So, in, in our lab, and the, that's the recommendation that I would do, you know, calculate your risk. If it's a risk you're comfortable living with, don't publish in the top journals. That's fine. I would never, I would never dare to um, ask of any of my people to do that sort of thing. If they're willing, I, I'd be happy if they do that, obviously. But if they're not ready to do it, and if they're scared of doing that, if they have a family and they don't want to risk that, then I would not. So I, I'm not telling my people where to publish. And I'll, I'll advise them, and I'll try to make it open access, but in the end, they call the shots, not me. Everything else, so if you can't get it into the top journals for other reasons, then you should not waste time with publishing. Try to get it out as quickly as possible to as many people as possible, obviously open access, so as many people can read it as possible, and get on with your research. And then finally, um, get your PI to do something. Ask your PI, what can I do with my code? What can I do with my data? How can I make sure that the person who comes after me who takes, uh, takes my project and leads it to the next level, that they can use my stuff? Pester your PI to provide you with the infrastructure that we don't have. So in three easy ways, or four, get your glam, don't waste time publishing, open your science and wear your open on your sleeve, obviously. So that's what I think um, what you can do. And here's what I think um, what we should do. So we've heard about utopias. Uh, a couple of times, and now my time's up. That's really good. It's because I'm, I'm about to finish. Um, Utopia is always just a couple of miles away, or 8,535 kilometers. And uh, here's my utopia. My utopia comes from, again, something that we've been uh, hearing about already today, about the $10 billion that we're currently wasting on legacy publishing. If you divide those two, $10 billion by about, the, about 2 million papers that we publish every year, it means that every paper in a subscription journal uh, costs about $5,000. Now, if you've listened to Juan talking earlier today, uh, you heard about Cielo, the Scientific Electronic Library Online, about how they do it in Latin America and now in many other countries. They do open access publishing, just fine, accessible for everyone, it's essentially the same services as uh, all the other publishers provide for anything, depending on how you count, between $50 and $200 per article. So if you do it smart, you can even go below $50 per article. So this is where I think the potential for innovation lies. So if we would collectively decide now, oh, we'll switch everything that we have one-to-one -one over to Cielo, this next year, if that were possible, theoretically, you can't cut subscriptions like that, but if you could do that, you would have anything between 9.5 and 9.8, 9.9 billion dollars at your disposal. Now, we have about 600 solutions to the problems that I've been talking about. We can easily buy all of them in an instance with $9 billion. We don't even need the 10th billion. We can even keep that for something else. Right? So that would be my suggestion. And uh, what we need for that is we need, obviously, those $10 billion only exist on a, like a, on a global scale. So we need to have global coordination, or at least among a willing few, 
ideally a willing many and even better a willing many heavy hitters that have uh, recognition. And then you let the subscriptions run out. You let the subscriptions run out and take the money, you know, persuade your institutions to not cut the money since you're not needing it for subscriptions anymore, but to leave library budgets intact where they are right now. And you use the money to implement the technology that we already have in a smart way. And with that kind of money, it shouldn't be too difficult to hire smart people to make sure that we're actually getting modern technology in a way that's leveraged for science and not for publishers. Now, this one would then allow us to provide us with an infrastructure where we don't have to worry what's going to happen to our code. We don't have to worry how to share our code. We don't have to worry if our code is going to be accessible 10 years from now or 20 years from now. Now, for the kind of stuff that we do, those, those walking flies, behavioral data, really on the grand scheme of things, don't really interest more than you know, one person in my postdoc or something like that. But these sorts of, that sort of code, climate change code, climate data, climate simulation, that's the kind of code that really has societal importance that needs to be there for the foreseeable future, for the de next couple of decades, and that need to be scrutinized by every single person on this planet to make sure that this is the best we can do. And this needs to be on an institutional basis and not on a ha ha haphazard basis uh, that, uh, where funding could run out three years from now. And the same, of course, is true for research data. This needs to be a matter of course that I don't have to worry. I just have, once I save my data on a drive that belongs to the institution, it needs to be accessible. And I need to jump through hoops to make it not accessible. And of course, our narrative, whether that's videos, presentations, or standard old school papers, they also need to be accessible. Now, until a couple of weeks ago, and this is going to be my concluding so slide, until a couple of weeks ago, um, I thought this is really a, a pie in the sky. This is really a utopia that's never going to happen. How am I going to get 10,000 um, institutions, 10,000 universities, and then I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of uh, non-university research organizations to sign up on this and to all simultaneously, more or less, cancel their subscriptions. Uh, and so that's what, uh, why I think this, uh, until very recently, this has characterized my hopes uh, quite well in that uh, we have the solutions. They're already there. Like, we have 600 of them. It's not that we have too few solutions. We have plenty. Um, the problem is really how to implement them and how to leverage them on a global scale. And uh, with that, uh, I will, uh, uh, since my time is up, all I can say at this point is that recently we've had and then uh, come up with an opportunity of how we can actually reduce. We can't eliminate the problem of scale and the problem of collective action, but we've come up with an idea of how maybe we can reduce the problem to by one, maybe even two orders of magnitude, and maybe even be able to get that sort of utopia re realized within the next couple of years. But my time is up, so I'll have to leave you with that cliffhanger for now. Thank you very much.